good news, great news, in fact, to start the show with. COVID cases are down, way down. But the pressure on China about what happened in that Wuhan lab and on Dr. Fauci about what he said to Congress is only heating up. All right, good evening. I'm Leland Vitter. We'll have the open to the show in just a minute. We've gotten used to hearing scary statistics about COVID for the past 18 months. This newscast, in addition to many others, have had really some scary headlines. Cases doubling, tripling, hotspots here and there. Well, how about this map? Our friends from Axios point out there is a 22% drop in cases per day over the past two weeks. COVID deaths are down 15%. Take a look at this map. You can see the states in green. That's where the case numbers are way down. The rest of the map that is in a yellow, cases are down there too. There's four states, only four, where cases are way up. That's Alaska, Montana, Michigan, Vermont, and then also New Hampshire. We're going to talk about Vermont and New Hampshire, especially Vermont, a little bit tomorrow because of that state's high vaccination rate, get into why that is. All right, we all heard from Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner. Here he is describing the state of COVID in America. The good news begs an important question. Can we forget mandates altogether, saving our country from the court battles and Thanksgiving dinner debates over the issues, over the van mandate issue, that is? We're going to get to that in a minute. There's another huge headline you may have missed about COVID. And that's about what happened in that lab in Wuhan. Many believe, and there is significant evidence to suggest, the coronavirus was engineered in that lab and then escaped because of the Chinese's extremely lax safety standards. And there's a lot of evidence that it perhaps escaped well before January of 2020. And U.S. intelligence has evidence that there were scientists who worked in that lab who were sick with COVID-like symptoms and even in the hospital as early as November 2019. Here's the really terrifying part. The U.S. funded research at that lab. And you might remember Dr. Fauci assured us that American money never went into gain-of-function research. And the term here is really important. Doctors will call it gain-of-function. That's layman terms for making the virus a lot more virulent, meaning it spreads a lot quicker, and also gain-of-function, a lot more deadly. I'm wondering now, how can the American people be assured as we, as we look at this that, for example, the money that went to the Wuhan lab didn't end, end up okay. uh, being well, used by the Chinese military? It seems as though well, you can't say that for certain. Well, can we again, with due respect, put things into perspective? The, the, um, the, the Wuhan lab is a very large lab to the tune of hundreds of millions, if not billion dollars. Right. Take that. The grant that we're talking about was $600,000 over five years for an average of about $125,000 to $140,000 a year. So now you're making extrapolation that we sent in. Uh, no, sir, I'm not, I'm not making any no, extrapolation. No sir, no, sir, no, sir, I'm not making any extrapolation. I'm simply saying the fact of the matter is, is that so much of what was we were told as Americans about what we knew from right. the Chinese was based simply on taking their word. Right. All right. That $600,000 grant is extraordinarily important because the NIH, Dr. Fauci's employer, changed its tune. Here is the headline today. This is the New York Post, among others. NIH admits to funding gain-of-function research in Wuhan despite Fauci's denials. All right, you heard Dr. Fauci with me. What he says on television, frankly, doesn't really matter. What Dr. Fauci says under oath on Capitol Hill matters an awful lot. Take a listen. Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly, and I want to say that officially. You do not know what you are talking about. It's a dance, and you're dancing around this because you're trying to obscure responsibility for four million people dying around the world okay. from a pandemic. You are implying that what we did was responsible for the deaths of individual. I totally resent and it could that. Have been. And if anybody and it could is have been. lying here, Senator, it is you. Gain of function research was. All great. right, so that was, you can still hear him arguing, that was Senator Rand Paul. He is going to be with us in a minute. His flight is a little bit late. He just got to the studio, but this is vindication for Senator Paul, and we want to get his reaction. We'll be the first 
cable network to have his reaction to Senator Paul in a minute. First, Shari Markson is also getting vindication on this. This is her book, What Really Happened in Wuhan. She's done an enormous amount of research on what happened in the lab and also the gain of function research and the funding. Shari joins us now from her native Australia. I guess it is good morning there. Nice to see you. Uh, all right. How big of a deal is this admission by the NIH? It's very significant. What we've seen so far, and I've got a whole chapter on Fauci in my book, is there's a lot of evidence. I mean, I mean, it was just factual that the NIH and other United States agencies were sending funding to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, particularly to fund work done by Shi Zhang Li on coronaviruses. In total, and I, I analyzed this uh, for my book, there are more than 60 research projects at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, 60 scientific projects, most on coronaviruses, that were funded with American funding, and again, mostly NIH funding. So this is a lot of research that was going on there. It included gain of function research. You can see that it's it's there in black and white in the scientific papers. And yet you have this situation uh, where Fauci has be been seven fifteen or seven eight it, completely denying it because he you know he he's supported by one side of politics by the Democrats. So there was no accountability. There was no interrogation. Uh, you know, everyone just took him at his word. Liland, you were the one journalist who actually gave him a hard time in that interview. I pay close attention to Fauci's interviews and they're all very soft except for yours. And that was a very important interview because in it, he admitted that he was funding research on coronaviruses in China to avoid an outbreak in the United States. That is just so significant of an admission and he made it in no one else's interview but yours. And the reason that's significant is because it shows that he understood the type of research that he was funding could cause an outbreak, could cause a pandemic. The stupidity is, of course, if there's an outbreak in China, that can lead to an outbreak in every single pocket of this globe as we've seen. Yeah, exactly what we've seen. Uh, Shari, stand by for a minute. Uh, we understand Senator Paul uh, has made it to the studio and we want to check in. Uh, Senator, I saw your tweet when you said, I told you so, doesn't even begin to describe it. Uh, this is real vindication for you, is it not? Well, for months and months, we've been saying that the NIH funded the Wuhan lab. At first, they denied that. For months and months, we've been saying that they funded gain-of-function research, where they take a virus from nature and combine it with another virus and create a virus that's not known in nature, that can be more dangerous, that can cause a pandemic. They denied that. And now we have the evidence from NIH, and it looks like NIH is starting to point fingers. So instead of it being Dr. Fauci's fault, they're going to say, oh, no, it was EcoHealth's fault. So the interesting thing will be if this divides Peter Dayzak from EcoHealth from Dr. Fauci, and if maybe they'll begin to testify against each other, maybe we'll get to some form of truth. But the bottom line is, yes, they took viruses that don't exist in nature. They combined them, created viruses that are more dangerous to the public, and uh, then they uh, had a, had a cover-up so this wouldn't be seen. And now they've been caught in a cover-up, and the NIH is exposing them. But to this day, people don't realize this. We're still funding research at the Wuhan lab. NIH, I say we, Dr. Fauci is, NIH is funding a five-year pro, uh, one project from EcoHealth that goes from 2020 to 2025. Hmm. To my knowledge, that program is still being funded and ongoing. Which in and of itself asks a lot of questions. But more importantly, why lie about it? You, you and the doctor got into a lot of debates over this. But if it was being done, why lie about it? Well, you have to realize that Dr. Fauci, for many years, has been a big advocate of gain of function. You know how he changes his tune on a lot of things? He's changed his tune because he, he realizes now that if this virus did come from the lab, there's a certain amount of moral culpability that attaches to him for being the biggest proponent of funding this type of research and lab. So throughout the years, he was a big supporter of gain of function. He even said, as you've mentioned, that even if we have an outbreak, the research would be worth it. As recently as a month ago, he was still saying that we should fund research in China. He doesn't seem to have learned his lesson. So all around, I think it's just been horrific judgment by him. But I think mainly he's been covering this up since that flurry of emails 
January 31st of a year ago. He's been covering it up because he doesn't want the responsibility for the pandemic at his door. And they're still trying to. If you read that NIH letter, there's still a little bit of uh, trying to mislead you or misdirect you into not believing that the virus could have come from the lab. And uh, I think that as the evidence continues to come out, it all points towards the lab. Interesting that you say it all points towards the lab because now floating through Chinese social media and through some Chinese state-sponsored social media accounts is this wild theory that the virus came from lobsters that the United States infected in Maine. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Doubts protest My too much. My response can be laughter. My only response can be laughter to that. Uh, but, you know, they also said the China, that the American military somehow right. brought it over there. Um, no, it's dangerous research. And the reason why I'm very ecumenical on this is that we're still doing this dangerous research in the U.S. And I don't think our labs are safe enough to be dealing with something that could cause, you know, 10, 15 percent of the world to die. And I'm not alone in this. You know, there's a scientist from MIT who's not a partisan who came out and said that this could be a civilization ending sort of pandemic at some point so that we really can't uh, continue to blithely go on this way without looking at regulating this kind of research. Hey, Senator, we only got about 60 seconds left because we promised to have you out so you could attend other engagements. But real quick, we're going to put a map up that just shows the really drop in cases around the country uh, in COVID cases, down 22 uh, percent. Is, is the pandemic coming to an end? Is it worth continuing to have the debates over vaccine mandates or is the mandates now protecting us against something that's going to be over soon? I don't, I don't think we know. I, in, in April and May, when we got down to less than 10,000 cases a day, I was hopeful that it was over. I really had a strong feeling that maybe we were beyond it, that we had enough herd immunity. I think the problem is, and this is what we may find maybe for a long time, is we get herd immunity to a certain variant and then the variant changes. So I think we got to a point of herd immunity for the wild variant, the original virus. But now with the Delta variant, we're once again sort of working our way back to close to herd immunity where it'll slow down. The question is, will, will this be the last variant or not? Viruses are mysterious in the way they come and go. The Spanish flu had no treatment, no vaccine, killed 50 million people, but then went away and never really came back in that form again. So uh, we don't know what will happen. I do think that the vaccine helps with safety if you're at risk. I think the monoclonal antibodies can save your life, but you got to get them in time. I'm encouraged that there's a new pill coming out. Yeah. I'm also a believer that the inhaled steroids given early in the course of the disease wow. can prevent some of the over exuberant reaction that people get in their lungs. Yeah, as you pointed out very well, uh, so many advances coming uh, so quickly. Senator, thanks for your time. Thanks for uh, hustling from the airport. We appreciate it. Thank you. All the best. Breaking news right now in Florida. The FBI has confirmed investigators found Brian Laundrie's remains. The FBI considered him a person of interest in the death of his girlfriend, Gabby Petito. Investigators found her body last month in Wyoming. News Nation's Brian N. joins us from Northport, Florida. All right, so is the story over or just beginning, Brian? Well, you know, I think that this is obviously a massive development that we can now report Brian Laundrie is dead. Uh, you know, we've been wondering where he is for literally the last six weeks. Uh, you've got yeah, the country and the world asking that question. So now we can say uh, that Brian Laundrie is dead. But no, I don't think the story is over because there are so many questions that we still don't have answered. What exactly happened to Gabby? What did Brian's parents know uh, in the beginning of all this when the search was still going on for Gabby? And then also the way all of this ended, uh, how parents find the, uh, the personal items that led to the remains just yesterday after a five-week FBI search in this reserve behind me. Brian, if you were expecting a soundbite, evidently it's continuing to load. Um, so we'll, we'll continue our conversation here. As you think about that, in the Northport Police, I understand, put out a statement saying, look, we know the parents didn't plant these items. It's sort of coincidental. Uh, as it was, has there ever been a moment that you've seen that the parents were in any way considered suspects or persons of interest in helping Brian Laundrie disappear? 
Uh, well, we haven't heard that at all from the FBI or from authorities. We know that they've been somewhat cooperative in the search for their own son. Several weeks ago, they went out in the swamp with police uh, and helped with the search, and then again alerted police yesterday and went out. So the last time I spoke to Northport police, they said that they were cooperative in the search for their own son. But here's the thing, Leland. All along, police have said that the laundries have not been cooperative when it comes to the investigation into Gabby Petito's death. They have not wanted to talk about Gabby Petito and what they know. So now that Brian Laundry is dead, uh, the FBI investigation will continue. Will that somehow involve Chris and Roberta Laundry? Will they be pulled into this? That could still happen. We don't know, though. Yeah, and you, you certainly hope that at some level, um, there is closure for the Petito family because the laundries know what happened to their son. They know that he uh, went into the reserve and is now perished in some way. But you really hope that Gabby Petito's parents uh, and family get some answer to how she died in Wyoming. Brian, thanks. We appreciate it. Uh, great reporting throughout this entire bizarre story by Brian Enton and our team there. Obviously, he's going to keep this up as we move on to the next chapter. Part of our reporting coming up tonight on News Nation Prime. Marnie talks to the Laundry family lawyer about the last time he, the lawyer, spoke to Brian. At any point in the last five weeks, have you spoken with Brian Laundry? Yes, I spoke to Brian Laundry on September 12th and September 13th. And what can you share about that conversation? Not much. Any conversation I had with Brian Laundry is uh, is privileged. Um, I can tell you that uh, you know Chris and Roberta have been worried about Brian Laundry since uh, Brian went out for the hike uh, on that Monday, and you know from there there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of accusations, um, a lot of uh, news outfits have proliferate, proliferated that misinformation. And I firmly believe that's why these protesters are out there, um, because this, this has just become a circus, uh, which there was no need for it to be that way. Hmm. Evidently, there's still protesters outside the laundry's home. That's a big part of Marnie's interview, and you can watch the full interview tonight on Prime, 9 Eastern, 8 Central. We press on now. Surprise, surprise. Facebook and its founder, well, may not be that forthcoming. The new details that you might not be surprised, but you need to hear. And who would have thought pigs could save your life? The new hope for hundreds of thousands of Americans because of what just happened. There's more than 100,000 Americans right now living with effective death sentences. They and their families are hoping and praying for a life-saving organ transplant just in time. They all just got game-changing news. In a first-of-its-kind surgery, surgeons have successfully transplanted a pig's kidney into a human patient. The organ came from a genetically altered pig. The surgical team says so far the kidney is functioning perfectly. And doctors are hoping that this breakthrough can help, obviously, so many more patients uh, in the future. Joining us now, Chad Ezel, Executive Vice President and COO of Life on New York that works with organ transplants and organ transplant patients, a uh, big part of this surgery. Uh, Chad, uh, great being with you. Thank you. I guess the question is, uh, how long is it till this becomes commonplace that people who are on dialysis right now can get a pig's kidney? Yeah, currently we're still in the research phase, but really we're looking at maybe two to five years that this could really become where we're transplanting these pig kidneys into uh, recipients. All right, so uh, currently, right, currently right now, we're the, the research phase is where we are transplanting these pig kidneys into neurologically deceased um, donors, um, where the patient is deceased, they're neurologically declared brain dead, um, and they are, they have authorized, their family is authorized for this research project to move forward with them. So we think about uh, U.S. transplant waiting lists, uh, 117,000 Americans on transplant waiting lists. Of those, 98,000 or so need a kidney. 12 people on the waiting list die uh, each day. At some point, if you're going to die without a kidney, uh, 
wouldn't you sort of just accept the risk of getting one from a pig? Um, yeah, it's up to each individual to decide that. I mean, we have people that there are patients on the waiting list for a kidney specifically that could wait over four years to get a transplant. So this type of, of, of research project that could we could um, mainstream pig kidneys being uh, transplanted into waiting recipients uh, would significantly decrease deaths on the wait list and, and save hundreds of lives. Yeah, it seems like that, 12, 12 people uh, each day. Why pigs? Well, pigs because the organs are of similar size as to humans, and genetically we're, we're somewhat similar in genetics. Um, what they've done is these, these pigs have been genetically modified where they've knocked out specific genes that decrease the amount of uh, rejection. So that way when they did transplant this kidney to this donor, they, they saw there was no acute rejection to the kidney. Hmm. Um, so that's what makes this so exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Uh, what does this mean? Does this mean that there's now research going on about pig hearts, pig lungs, pig livers? That we're starting the clinical trials with that as well. Uh, we're starting with kidneys. It'll probably be next up would probably be hearts. Um, livers and lungs are a little bit more, um, a little more difficult to be able to transplant under these types of circumstances. Wow. Um, but this, but we are, we are investigating that. Yeah, r really incredible and gives such hope to so many. Uh, great work, Chad. Thanks for coming on and sharing it. Thank you, sir. All right. Next to that hot, hot governor's race in Virginia. Election is less than two weeks away. How outside influencers are now taking hold in the race. So that was the U.S. Attorney General with members of Congress. The debate in the last two weeks over critical race theory has become not only a big issue on Capitol Hill, but a big focus in the Virginia governor's race, particularly the question of how much say parents should get in their kids' education. Terry McAuliffe is now doing damage control. Terry McAuliffe's the Democrat running for governor in Virginia amid backlash over his comments that parents should stay out of it. But McAuliffe says his comments are being misportrayed. Glenn Youngkin's taking my words out of context. I've always valued the concerns of parents. Okay, so that's what he said in the ad. Here's what McAuliffe, McAuliffe's own words at the debate. I'm not going to let parents come into schools and actually you take books out and make their own decision. You vetoed it. So, to yeah, I stopped the bill that I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. And as you might imagine, Glenn Youngkin, the Republican, who's now neck and neck in the polls, has put it in his own ad. Virginia parents have a right to make decisions on their children's education. That's the Virginia I grew up in. Education is front and center. A new poll shows Glenn Youngkin one point over Terry McAuliffe when it comes to who voters trust more on leading schools. Back in August, McAuliffe was up five points on the issue. We bring in Lachlan Marquet, Axios political reporter, Miles Coleman, associate editor at Sabato's Crystal Ball, the University of Virginia Center of Politics. Gentlemen, appreciate it. Um, Lachlan, start with you because of your uh, original reporting, some great reporting this morning in Axios on really who is behind both uh, McAuliffe's money and Youngkin's money. Yeah, well, Glenn, uh, McAuliffe is one of the legendary fundraisers of the Democratic Party. That's really how he came up through Democratic politics. And so it's not particularly surprising that he's doing really well in D.C. and the D.C. suburbs. In Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia he's far outraising Youngkin. Youngkin is doing much better in uh, the areas around Roanoke, Virginia Beach. Um, and overall, we found that Youngkin actually has a slight lead, about half a million dollar lead over McAuliffe in fundraising purely from Virginia and a majority of his donations. And that's excluding the money that Youngkin himself has donated to his own campaign has actually come from in state. Whereas for McAuliffe, it's actually split. It's about a third each. You have a third Virginia, a third D.C., and a third in the rest of the country. And wow. McAuliffe is out raising Youngkin overall, but a lot of that reflects the money he's getting from that D.C. area. Yeah, and certainly that old fundraising network uh, in Palm Beach and in New York and out on uh, 
the West Coast certainly helps. Uh, Miles, we look at the polling right now, 46-46. This is quite literally in UVA's backyard. So there's no sense arguing the horse race of who's ahead right now. Youngkin's got the momentum, uh, if nothing else. But uh, what are the telltales that you're looking for in the next uh, two weeks? Sure. Uh, so I think we a bit touched on it earlier. Uh, but what it's going to come down to, I think, is enthusiasm. And you have to look at the trend line. Uh, sure, it's a tied poll, but in the last poll, McAuliffe was up by a few points. Uh, something I'm looking at is the independent vote. Uh, that poll from yesterday had Youngkin up nine points with independence. Virginia is a blue enough state that the Democrats can afford to lose independence, uh, but they just can't get blown out. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when McAuliffe last won in 2013, uh, the exit polls had him lose an independence by nine points, the exact same spread he's down wow. by now. So, like, he can't fall too much more with those independents. Uh, it's what makes races like this fascinating for reporters, because it truly is a toss-up. The punditry doesn't really matter. You actually kind of have to follow uh, the storylines. Uh, Lachlan, that brings us to a pundit. Uh, James Carville, obviously of a good friend of Terry McAuliffe, part of Clinton World, was the guy who came up with It's the Economy, Stupid. Uh, here is Carville talking about this race. You know, we're in a very tight race, and Democrats need to be activated. It's close. There's no doubt about it, and I'm scared to death. Hmm. All right, he's scared to death. What else can Team McAuliffe do? Well, I think you're seeing seeing it right now in the A-list figures that they're bringing in to campaign with McAuliffe in the final days of the race. Everyone up to and including President Biden. You have Kamala Harris. You have Nancy Pelosi. You have Stacey Abrams. I mean, it's really the heavy hitters that are coming in and trying to get out the vote because that's really what this is going to come down to. You know, it's not just an off-year election. You know, but Virginia has this, you know, this four-year offset races where, you know, virtually nobody nationwide is going to the polls except in a couple of states. So it's all about boosting enthusiasm for those those core voters. And that's why you're seeing those big names come in. That's what Team McAuliffe is hoping they can get done. Yeah, certainly you, you bring up an excellent point in terms of bringing in the heavy hitters. But, uh, Miles, how, I'm wondering how Stacey Abrams and some of the more liberal members of the Democratic Party uh, – Barack and Michelle Obama, Kamala Harris especially, how do they play with rural Democratic Virginia voters? Sure. Uh, well, what I would say overall uh, is in this state, definitely in the Trump era, the Democrats have gained a lot with college-educated whites. Well, a lot of those voters uh, used to be Republicans um, or are at least still open to maybe a certain type of Republican. Or a certain type of Republican. Could Youngkin be, be that? Maybe. So you have to remember that the core of the Democratic coalition in this state is black voters. Uh, and if McAuliffe ends up losing, uh, basically lackluster black turnout is probably going to be a reason why. Hmm. So if I'm him, I wouldn't mind uh, cam campaigning with uh, Obama or Stacey Abrams if it means getting that black turnout up. Now, it's important to see, and it's not only Northern Virginia. You also have to think about Richmond, Norfolk, uh, a couple of other cities there, some, some in Roanoke, but mostly uh, Richmond uh, and Norfolk. Lachlan and Miles, uh, you both came with high expectations. Gentlemen, you exceeded them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want to zero in on Virginia as a microcosm. That's a state that President Biden won by 10 points. Tara McAuliffe really should be a shoe in win this by a couple of touchdowns. But as he recently admitted in a conference call, Virginians are not exactly a fan of the president right now. Now, as we heard, Biden will be campaigning with McAuliffe next week in Northern Virginia. Vice President Kamala Harris is in Virginia today. One of the things that they do not want to talk about is one of Biden and McAuliffe's biggest challenges right now, inflation, regular gas up 56% compared to a year ago, meat, Fish and eggs up 11%. Appliances and dishwashers up 19%. Gas prices, average gallon of gas, $3.37 nationally. That's above the $3 in Virginia for the first time since 2014. There's a gas station in California well over $7. With that, we bring in Bob Cusack, editor-in-chief of The Hill, our sister company. Bob, great to see you uh, as always. 
does Biden help or hurt in Virginia right now? I think overall, right now, Leland, I think he's he's hurting McAuliffe, and that's why McAuliffe, who has been around politics for a long time, uh, is distancing himself from the president. He wasn't doing that around July 4th. If the election had been held around July 4th, McAuliffe wins by double digits, no doubt. But since then, it's been a rough summer and early fall for the president. Uh, they have all these problems. Biden says they're going to solve them. Uh, inflation, gas prices, uh, inability to get legislation done. He just hasn't had a big win. He needs one soon, and there's not one on the horizon because, you know, they had this deadline of trying to get these bills done uh, by uh, the infrastructure bill and the social spending bill by Halloween. Just no chance that's happening. So uh, this is going to be a very close race. And as you said, Youngkin has the momentum. Yeah, you make a great point in that Biden needs and Democrats need a big win. Even Terry McAuliffe said Democrats in Congress have got to get their act together and get at least something passed. And that would help me if it happens before November 2nd, hurt me if it ha doesn't happen until November 2nd. That brings us to what's happening on Capitol Hill of this continued debate among Democrats is infighting. Uh, you're listening to sort of the vitriol by Democrats against Kirsten Sinema and to a lesser extent against Joe Manchin. It almost feels as though there's some Democrats who hate Senator Sinema more than they hate Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean, Sinema is up for re-election 2024, and there's already a lot of speculation about a primary challenge, and, and whoever that challenge is could be uh, Congressman Gallego, would raise a lot of money from the left. Uh, there is a lot of frustration with Sinema. Manchin is media-friendly, so he explains his rationale. Sinema does not. Uh, she's not She's not the uh, usual uh, senator. She's not very clubby, and uh, she certainly is, is putting down parameters of, of what she wants uh, after really not saying what she wants for a long time. And it's just frustrating the left, and I'm sure it's frustrating uh, candidates who are running uh, this November, most notably McAuliffe. And McAuliffe, it's interesting, when it has been kind of bashing Washington, which is what you do when you try to get elected. The, the problem for McAuliffe is that who runs Washington? It's his own party. Well, and there's hardly a figure who is more of a Washington institution, a political insider, than Terry, Terry the Mac McAuliffe. Uh, we, we think about what's happening my dad used to always say about business nothing gets colder faster than a hot deal is that what has happened right now in virginia and sorry pardon me is that's what happened on capitol hill to bipartisan infrastructure and build back better yeah, I mean, when, when you're moving a bill, you, you want to have momentum. It's like a, a sports team. You want to keep going. You don't want to pause. You don't want to have a bye week. And, and that's what's happened with this infrastructure bill. It had all this momentum, <clears throat> got good headlines for Biden after it passed the Senate. And then the White House did not push the House progressives to... to to you know, hold their nose because they don't like that bill and vote for it. They they're basically holding that one hostage uh, for the bigger bill, and, and that's why we're going to be here uh, for a couple more months uh, into into uh, probably Christmas season before anything gets done. I think something will get done, uh, but it's going to be really bumpy between now and then. Yeah, I, I was about to say I have this feeling that both Thanksgiving week and Christmas week might be inflection points, which is uh, great for us in one way and bad for anybody who wants to spend the holidays with their with their families. <laughs> Bob, thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. And as we said, On Balance is going to be on the road for this race in Virginia. Monday the 1st, we're going to be live on the ground in Virginia for closing arguments between McCulloch and Yunkin, November 2nd, live from the nation's capital as the numbers come in. Something else we've been covering a lot, the situation at the southern border. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. And now some media outlets, even on the far left, are starting to admit it. What MSNBC is now saying that we've been saying all along. That was former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson on MSNBC this morning saying the influx of immigrants at the southern border is something that cannot be sustained by this country, something many Americans in border states already know. Brandon Judd also knows that. He's been saying it for a long time, president of the National Border Council of Border Patrol agents. Brandon, good to see you. Uh, is it come as a surprise that Jay Johnson, who was DHS secretary, is finally admitting this? 
No, it's not. It's not surprising that he's admitting it. What is surprising is now that he says it, all of a sudden, um, outlets like MSNBC are going to say, "Oh, yeah, it's it's unsustainable." We've known that. Everybody has known that. You've known that, Leland. You've covered this for an awful long time. Um, but outlets like MSNBC, they've hidden their their heads in the sand, pretending like nothing's happening on the border until somebody like Jay Johnson comes out and says it. That's the hypocrisy that we that we can expect from MSNBC. It's kind of given them cover in a way to now all go, oh, well, now we have to do something uh, about the border and Republicans are going to obstruct, which is where the conversation normally goes. Uh, Morning America this morning, Adrian uh, Bankart was talking with Senator Rick, Rick Scott. Take a listen. He is not doing his job. His job is to secure, secure the border and keep Americans safe. We've got fentanyl coming all across our border now. We've got people dying because of all this fentanyl. Uh, we don't know who's coming across our border. Mayorkas needs to resign. Talking about uh, Secretary Mayorkas of DHS right now. Brandon, I'm sure you don't like Secretary Mayorkas. You think he should resign, too. He's not going to resign. Does Jay Johnson's comments this morning and this sort of realization now that what's happening at the border is a crisis give us any chance of actually having Secretary Marcus change course and do something about it and let your Border Patrol agents do something about it? Not if they continue to call it a humanitarian crisis. I mean, at least they're using the word crisis, but now they're trying to deflect and they're trying to say it's a humanitarian crisis. You can expect that they're going to go back and they're going to start talking about the root causes again, how governments are unstable and climate change and all of these other things. They're going to continue to deflect because they don't want to stop illegal immigration. And that's the main problem. If you don't want to stop it, you're going to continue to invite people across the border illegally and it's going to continue. I do not see an end to this anytime soon soon. Well, that's the scary part. We'll leave it there. Already 1.7 million migrants detained in 2021. That's the fiscal year, 200,000 uh, a month. And we know, we know your agents are overwhelmed, Brandon. We always appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Leland. Yeah. Facebook caught in yet another lie why different rules apply to different users. Facebook and its founder, Mark Zuckerberg, appear to be caught in a lie yet again. A new report from the company's own oversight board says Facebook wasn't forthcoming about internal rules. Turns out certain content restrictions do not apply to high profile or VIP users like celebrities and politicians. Evan Greer is the director of the digital rights group Fight for the Future, joins us now. Uh, Evan, thank you. Appreciate you being with us. Should this come as a surprise to us? I don't think this should be a surprise at all. This is the direct result of having too few companies that have too much power over what we can say, what we can see, what we can hear online. Facebook is essentially a monopoly. And until we address that problem, we're going to have these uneven content moderation policies where there's one set of rules for the rich and powerful and a different set of rules for everyone else. Okay, so you think about sort of how Zuckerberg has built uh, Facebook. Uh, interestingly enough, this is what he said about 2010, about people trusting him. Uh, I have over 4,000 emails, pictures. Uh, what, how'd you manage that? Uh, this is from an email. Uh, people just submitted it. I don't know why they trust me, dumb expletives. It seems as though, at least right now, we still trust Facebook, don't we? I don't think people should trust Facebook at all. And I don't think people should trust Facebook with their personal data, but I also don't think we should trust Facebook with making difficult decisions about what type of speech to allow and what type of speech to be suppressed. Again, that's why we can't go back and forth forever working the refs in a game that we, the people, always lose. We need policies that strike at the root of the harm of these companies, which is that they use manipulative algorithms to pick and choose so, what we can so see the, so, so the they keep us on our platform clicking and scrolling. Is government the answer? Because I, I've yet to find a problem that government solves well. <laughs> I would tend to generally agree with you there, but I do think in this case, we do need basic privacy legislation. I don't think any of these proposals to tinker with Section 230 or attempt to regulate free speech online are going to work. I think they'll do more harm than good, but I do think we can take aim at the surveillance practices that these companies use to monitor all of our behavior and then use that to recommend content in order to serve us more ads. That's right, where right, lawmakers, right. So it's sort of make a difference. Man it put in regulations in terms of what they can do, not what speech they can allow. 
uh, that would change things. One of the people who came out and really advocated for that and talked about how terrible Facebook is, the Facebook uh, whistleblower. Uh, we understand now that she was financed by Pierre Omidar. Politico broke that story this morning. Everyone was so outraged when they listened to her at the hearings. But should we take what she said with a grain of salt, considering that she seems now much more to be a activist with money behind her than she is a whistleblower? You know, I'm not actually sure that that's an accurate depiction. I think the Politico report shows that the Omidyar network funded uh, the whistleblower defense uh, organization that's providing her with legal services and that they started doing so after she came out as a whistleblower. I think it's important that we don't make false equivalencies here. Facebook has an army of lawyers and lobbyists that they're using to influence politicians in Washington, D.C. It makes sense that someone who would go up against them and call out their wrongdoing uh, would need some support. Well, uh, the Facebook whistleblower certainly has gotten uh, a lot of support. Uh, Evan, really appreciate you coming on. It's always an interesting conversation, uh, thoughtful and nuanced, which is unusual in this world. It's good to see you. <laughs> always good to see you and always happy to bring that nuance where yeah. it's needed. Well, it, it, it's, it's needed uh, in America and on social media. We don't get it on social media. Fight for the Futures, the group. Uh, Evan Greer is the director. Thanks for being with us. Evan, uh, more on the Brian Laundry identification. Brian Laundry, Gabby Tito's boyfriend, is dead. Dan Abrams breaks down what that means for the case next.